guys, it's Biggs. Now, in a day or two, I'm gonna be home again. I'm on the road again, as I always am. In a day or two, the day you're gonna be watching this video is one of my favorite days of the year. It's Halloween, man. It's gonna be super awesome, I'm super stoked. I always fly home, doesn't matter where I am in the world, I'm always gonna be home on Halloween to take my kids trick-or-treating. It was such an important thing to me when I was a kid growing up, I loved it all the time. Love getting dressed up and everything like that and doing all the fun shenanigans. And now I get to do it with my kids, so it's even gonna be even cooler. But I thought, how appropriate for today. When I was down in PA, I got to spend uh, a few days with one of my dearest friends. You guys know her well, Miss O, the lady, uh, Miss Rachel O'Leary. And uh, Rachel's, Rachel's gone through a lot of changes, not just with her fish keeping and everything like that, but uh, she's also got her greenhouse and her YouTube channel's evolving all the time, and she's very much a mentor to me, but one thing that she's done is now she's gotten big into something that's near and dear to me, and that's carnivorous plants. These are plants that eat things, that eat meats, eat bugs. Scared yet? Because some of these things look pretty scary if you get up close with them with a macro lens, but I thought it'd be really nice and appropriate today, being Halloween, if we go and investigate and have a little discussion with Miss O about her little bog of horrors. Enjoy, if you dare. Or water them from the bottom. Rachel's gonna give us a quick tour of some of her little shop of horror plants here. Yeah, I have a whole lot of species. I've got quite a few different types of Saracenia, which are the pitcher plants. Um, and you'll see flowers everywhere. Generally, they flower in the spring, but there's actually a new flower erupting, which is weird for this time of year, but I guess the- The excessive heat? The Saracenia flower. No, um, I, I really, I've never had them flower in the fall, but maybe it's normal, who knows? As you look around, you can see that a lot of the little Draceras or sundews have flowers that are expiring, and then they go to reseed, and that's how they come back the next year. Um, even ones like this Vinata, which is a tropical species because it threw out such a tremendous amount of seed will reseed in the soil, freeze, and then come back. Uh, you can see the Venus fly traps are doing super well. Um, I do remove their flowers because if you leave the flowers, then the energy goes into maintaining the flower. If you take off it, take it off, then the, the power goes into the traps. Um, this is a rescue fly trap I got from a local store. It was in one of those cups, yep. and it was brown. And so I was seeing if I could recover it. Um, there's lots of like, this is bug bat, which is a Papuria hybrid, or this is yellow jacket. Which one's bug bat? I don't know, I put it in here somewhere. Oh, little there's fly traps, everything's in here. Yeah, fly traps, these are, um, this is an orchid. There's about 20 orchids. This is a bog violet, which gets little really beautiful white flowers. Um, right now it's looking past because it's already gone to seed. You can see there's a little volunteer rotundifolia another little sundew. So my favorite thing about this garden is everywhere you look, you see where things have gone to seed. And certainly the most prolific is the Drosera filiformis, the straight one. Yeah, I see and so there's some seeds here that might vanish this weekend, every, just saying. Yeah, that's fine. Everywhere you go, you see filiformis colonizing. There's little tiny baby plants everywhere. And it can actually be considered a pest, but it doesn't bother me one bit. You also notice on the surface of the soil, which is a mix of peat and sand, there are various mosses, there's live sphagnum, um, and there's like native star grasses and stuff that I have allowed to stay in here uh, because it really helps with the soil integrity and the soil humidity. And this is watered through a standpipe that goes to a lattice that was laid underneath the substrate so that I can water it from the bottom up as well as it benefiting from rain. And with carnivorous plants in particular, you want to use rainwater, distilled water, or RO water as they get all of their nutrients from eating bugs. That's why they've developed these traps. This is the bug bat. That thing's gotten huge. No wonder I didn't think it was it. Um, and I work with a bunch of species. This is like a wild species that's critically threatened. So is this, so is this. But then there's some of the leucos, which are hybrids. Um, the scarlet bell. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they're really, really beautiful. So carnivorous plants grow almost everywhere in the world. So I have species in my house that are tropical 
All of these, for the most part, require at least uh, 40 days, uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit in order to have um, a cool down period. So they do great out here. I do overwinter them. I have videos on that. I have a secondary bog here that I haven't actually formally filled out yet. Um, I picked up these, uh, these are uh, trays what? for mixing concrete. Okay. I forget what they're called, but maybe it says. They're all nice and smooth, round edges. Yeah, they're $13 at <laughs> Lowe's and they make great bogs. You can fill them up with your, your peat and your sand. Um, and they just make perfect bogs. This is the tray for a hot water heater that I just bought a uh, some PVC parts and plugged off. But again, I'll be doing maybe a whiskey barrel bog or maybe in one of these or maybe both with the amount of plants I have. This is all one plant. Do you have to, uh, like these big, the big concrete planter, do you have to have to worry about, like if you went through weeks and weeks of rain, which you guys have often done, do you ever have to worry about too much water? No, what I did is I lined it with pond liner and I kept the pond liner with gaps on the outside so that if it fills up and the surface is completely waterlogged, the water can get behind it and drain back down to the ground. Okay. So the bottom of these... That's something you had to think about. Yeah, Yeah. the bottom of these sinks have a, a, like a two inch two inch hole from when they were plumbed to water so I yeah these are repurposed giant sinks that your husband yeah, found these would have been come out of a giant old high school or something yeah they're called um bradley sinks and they're made out of terrazzo which is concrete and marble chips and because of that as well i had to line it with pond liner because that could uh increase the hardness of the soil which would have been bad for the ball garden so this was a very big experiment this is the second growing season and i think it's insanely successful um i come out here every morning with my coffee and pull weeds and just look at stuff if you look inside the pitchers you'll see that almost all of them are completely full as you look at the sundews they're all full of bugs um, and you can see all the different strategies utilized by these particular temperate carnivorous plants you've got the ones where the pitchers stay open you've got ones like these where the pitchers close you've got the sundews that curl up you've got the, like these guys will close like a mitt around their prey. You've got ones like these where the, the bugs just stick to them and the fly traps that close, of course. And I just find it to be so fascinating, especially with the diversity of colors and sizes and shapes. Um, it's just been super rewarding and especially to see them do so well. These particular grasses. Um, that'll, that'll just spread like wildfire. Yeah, it does. And like this one, I just rip off the seed pods because I like how that looks for now because it was filling a hole. And it's not rampant spreading. Right. And then there's like these little dudes that are technically a weed, but I think they're pretty, so I leave them. Uh, and then there's not weed, which we may or might, I may have. There's not weed in here too. And then there's this neat little purple clover that I like that gets neat little like fuzzy flowers, so I've left that. Yeah, it's just, just you know, a different and dimension to the whole garden. The, the main thing with, with something like this is really deciding what you want to let take over because it is such a such a, a great environment for things to grow, especially with shallow roots. Um, so you have to pay attention and sort of pick and choose so as things don't take over. But now for this garden, Rachel, what do you got to do when it comes to time from winter? I Like I come from Canada, so our temperatures get decidedly colder. Um, well... I wait until about the first frost. All of these plants can take profoundly cold weather. The thing that you want to avoid is them getting super cold, super fast. So once, you know, it's getting down near freezing overnight or below freezing overnight, I will lay down burlap and then cover it with about six to 10 inches of um, pine litter, just pine needles. And they also make stuff called winter cloth, which is a white cloth that you can lay over that as well. And a lot of people will cut all the pictures back. I generally only cut back ones that look like, like I would, I would trim this one back because this top part's dead. Um, I would remove ones like that are obviously dead, but I leave the rest. And that's because once uh, the weather is to the point where it's no longer doing solid freezes, I uncover it and it starts growing right away. And at that point, I can trim off anything that didn't make it through the winter. But a lot of this stuff does. And especially with the species like um, Yellow Jacket and Purpurea, those guys, you don't, 
I mean, their, their pitchers will come through the winter completely intact. But that What's was, this one? That is Scarlet Bell. It's a Saracenia. Do they flower when they're in here? No. I have not flowered them in these floating containers, which is why I started the bog, because I really wanted to see that. But the other thing is, is some of these plants can take, <coughs> excuse me, like three or four years to really get to the maturity where they would develop a flower stalk. Okay. Most of the ones that are in my bog are ones that I had for a couple of years before I planted them in there. That's bug bat, another Saracenia, and more of the Scarlet Bell. Now, when people think of coniferous plants, usually the first plant that they associate it with is they think about this one here, the common Venus flytrap. You know, it's a very, very prevalent species. It's often sold in garden centers. It's even sold sometimes in grocery stores in those little tiny cups. The problem being is it is a true temperate species, and the problem with it is that you can keep it indoors and enjoy it, but the problem is it's going to need a winter rest. To do that, you could literally just take the cup in its soil and uh, let it dry out a little bit and then cover it and put it in a Tupperware and then put it in your fridge for about 40 days and then bring it out and it'll start to regrow and enjoy. You can see that the, the daddy long leg spider here has become a meal to one of, the, uh, one of the cups. Very, very cool species. She also does a lot of different types of natural sundews and with this type of a bog garden, the way she's got it set up, is a lot of the stuff can, pl can completely seed and naturalize itself. So a lot of stuff is popping up all, thro all throughout it. So your little Venus fly traps are popping up all over the place. There's another one over there inside there beside the base of that big Saracenia. You know, there's flowers, there's spent flowers all over the place on these plants. They've already dropped most of their seeds for this year. Here's a little tiny new spe a different species of sundew. But the diversity, the color, you can't beat carnivorous plants for the sheer oddity and appeal. And as Rachel's shown us, they're really, really easy to grow as long as you follow some very basic steps. Traps are all filled with water, so you can see the traps are easy and there's going to be some sort of an attractant that's going to get the, the flies or the insects to go in there and then they're going to drown and then the acids within that water is slowly going to start to dissolve and make that prey its meal. This one's really cool in the fact that uh, it leaves the traps just a little bit open, but once it actually catches something the traps close shut so the animal has no form of escape. And then it eats its food. So these are indoor sundews or drosera. And pingularia, which is Mexican butterwort. Now where's the carnivorous aspect of the butterworts? They have little tiny filaments with sticky stuff on it. Oh, right we do on the see it. Of yeah, meat. we do see it. Very primitive. Hello. Now I hope you guys enjoyed this little tour of Rachel's little bog of horrors. Now if you guys have any passing interest in, in, in studying anything about uh, park carnivorous plants, I can strongly recommend one particular book. I've had the book for probably about 20 years. I know it's gone through a couple of revisions, but the book is called The Savage Garden. We'll show it right here. It's by Peter D'Amato. Uh, it's a guy out of California who runs a massive greenhouse on carnivorous plants. This is, guy, this is the guy that knows it all. It's the guy that started a lot of it for us, brought all the, all the information to us. It's an awesome, awesome book, even if you just have a passing interest. So with that, thank you very much for watching. As always, I enjoyed having you, and happy Halloween to you. Take care, guys. See you next time.